don't know that when you lift your hands, you're lifting a hand toward the Lion of Judah to war for us as we worship Him. Amen. Amen. And, and then you lift your left hand toward Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple of praise and rebuilding the kingdom of God. Amen. And in the center of that is Mount Calvary. In the center of your heart is the cross of Jesus Christ that makes it all possible. Amen. See, so we don't fully understand what we do, and we're not trying to uh, promote an image in your mind of this is what it actually looks like, but we are trying to promote a, um, something deep inside of you. And, and, you know, that's what God is doing this morning. I can feel it stirring, you know, deeper than my mind and deeper than my heart into my very soul and spirit. Amen. And that's what God's doing this morning. And if you have your Bibles and you'd like to read along, you're welcome to. And we're going to start in John uh, chapter 8. And we're going to read some of the words of Christ. And then we're going to go over to the book of Ephesians. And, and I, this will be the scriptures you'll need to study for the next week. How many of you are going to study the scriptures I give you this morning? I, I believe that if you will do that, and I don't mean just read them every day. I mean get you a strong concordance and start looking up words and start finding understanding and start studying the Bible so that you understand what the Bible actually means. Uh, the Bible says in verse 28, Then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He. He says, And I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. He said, I carry the vision of the Father, I carry the word of the Father, I carry the action of the Father, and I don't do anything of myself. My Lord, if we had a church like that, where people did not do anything of their self, but did what the Father is doing right now and wanted us to do. He said, I do the things that always please Him. He said, He sent me and is with me, and the Father has not left me alone. And He spake these words, and many believed on Him. And then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in My word, then you are My disciples indeed. And then... And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many of you are free this morning? Amen. What does that mean? That you know the truth. Now, you know that the truth is not something that I say. I pray that everything that I say in my life is true. But the truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. The Bible says that he is Grace and truth. First John, uh, John chapter 1, very clear on that. He didn't preach grace. He is grace and he is truth. And when you meet Christ, you meet grace and you meet truth, but you enter the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't preach grace. Jesus is grace. Jesus didn't preach truth. That's who he is. But he preached the kingdom, a kingdom that is based upon who he is, grace and truth. So if you've got an issue with grace or you've got an issue with truth, you have an issue with him. Amen. Nobody should have an issue with grace and truth because those are wonderful things. But it seems like in the Bible that a lot of people did. You ever notice that? It seems like today... That a lot, why, do, why does the world not like Jesus Christ? Why can they have a God or the God or some God or an idea of deity, but you cannot have Christ? It's because of who He is. He is grace and He is truth. And the world does not want grace and the world does not want truth because it's easier to walk and believe a lie, or so it seems. And I've met people like that. They thought it was easier to tell a little lie to push an issue out of the way and walk on. Oh, yeah, simple things. I was, I'm going to share a story, then I'm going to get back to the Word. I was working a young man, and this young man was very intelligent. He was probably one of the first young men that I ever hired that really impressed me. I knew he was a little too smart for his own good, though. You know, I mean, you've met people like that. And um, 
And so we're working in a church, no less, and, 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 I, and we dropped a screw. Well, I, I had plenty of screws laying there. I wasn't going to walk around, go down the steps, go down there and hunt a screw. You know I mean? I wasn't going to ask him to do that, which would have been his job had I so said to. And so there's a, one of the older, the elders, uh, the, the father of the pastor actually sitting there, and we're putting this intricate glass wall together. And he's like, well, did you find that part? He looked at my helper. And he just looked at him. He said, uh, he, he said, did you find that screw? And, and, and I can't, he may have went down and looked for it for a minute. I can't remember. He just looked at him. He says, oh, yeah, we found it. No problem. And I looked at him, and I said, uh, you know, you just told a lie. And he, he said, what do you mean? I said, we didn't find that part. That man sat here and watched you. He knew you didn't find that part. And he goes, well, it was just easier to say that than to tell, tend to explain to him the truth. You see what I'm saying? So he just lied to him. But see, the problem is, is the man sitting there, he's witnessing the truth. He knows the truth, but he's getting lied to. And I, I'm thinking... My God, son, why would you want to do that for such a simple... Think about if this young man was under pressure, would he lie? <laughs> he, he would become a professional liar under pressure, see. see you, so you see these examples in life and you think... And then you know immediately this young man's not trustworthy. Well, this young man is not... Um, if he'll lie, he'll steal. I, I'm going to tell you something. Anybody that lies steal, they just go together. I don't know why, but my whole life, anybody that ever would lie to me would steal from me. I don't know why. I did have to dismiss this young man for stealing on down the line. But, you know, because I walk in grace and truth, even though I knew that truth, I gave him grace and gave him an opportunity. Even though I knew he was a liar and a thief. You say, well, how can you, how can you do that, Pastor? I have gave people opportunities in ministry that I knew were liars and thieves. Why did you do that, Pastor? Because Jesus did. It's simple. One time I, I had uh, you know, a staff leader that was, he was a very uh, charismatic leader. I mean, people loved him. He was, he was, a, you know, he was just a good guy, too. And, and he... Uh, and, and, and I watched him, and, and for three years, I, I, I didn't really know how he was managing everything that was entrusted into him. I just took him at face value. And, and so then I began to check after about three years. And I began to find out that he wasn't a very good steward. As a matter of fact, not only was he not a good steward, he didn't even pay tithes. He's one of my leaders. And, and, and I sit him down, and I had that talk with him, you know, that talk that nobody wants to have about grace and truth. Amen. So I began to remove all authority from him. Well, that didn't go over real big with him. But it was the right thing to do. He had had three years to figure it out. And I, and I got on my knees and I wept before God. And I was like, God, what, why would you not reveal to me what this man was doing? It's because he wanted to know, me to know what Jesus felt like when he let a thief carry his bag for three years. Those are some hard lessons. But they teach us lessons about grace and truth that we could not know otherwise. We know truth, especially when God reveals it to us, and we're supposed to give grace in every situation because that's who He is and that's how He is. Aren't you glad that Jesus gave you grace <laughs> in truth? You see what I'm saying? So it works for us. Not against us. Now, with that clarified, I, I want to move on this morning. And, you know, he said, if you continue in my disciples, then you are my, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Now, there's no Greek word for indeed. But if you, if you look it up and you define it, you find that it's an adverb. It means conver a confirmation, an underscoring of an important point. A fact or truth amplifier. Isn't that interesting? It amplifies the word that is being spoken about. It actually does. To be sure, to the degree. Now, what he, it, you will be, he, what he says is if you abide in my, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. He's amplifying what you're going to be. 
if you stay in his word. He's, he's trying to make a point here. I don't know exactly how it went in the Greek, but I can tell you the point that he's trying to make is discipleship means that someone has been authentically trained and is disciplined and operates in a certain way. What way? In the word of God. If you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples indeed. Well, we continue in the word of God until we find something we don't like. And that's when we start dealing with truth. And that's when we need grace. Amen. Come on. I'm reading on. I'm, I'm going somewhere this morning. You're going to like this before it's over with. And um, then he goes on, and Jesus, uh, and many, and as he spoke these words, many believed on him. And as we go down here to where I was, he says, then he goes on and he says, and you shall know the truth if you, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's seed, and we are never in bondage to any man. How say that you shall be made free? There's never been a bigger lie told. They were in bondage to Rome. The whole world was enslaved to Rome at this time. They, they didn't even recognize that they were slaves, but they were. He, and Jesus answered them. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. He's saying if you're going to serve sin, you're not going to stay in the father's house forever. There will come a time when you will have to deal with grace and truth. And when you deal with grace and truth, it will tell you who you are. And then it will be determined whether you stay or not. Then he says, the son shall make you free, and you shall be free indeed. There it is again. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. I want you to go to your Bibles in the book of Ephesians, if you have them with you. And this is the, the book of Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, if I, told, if I said something about the armor of God, you would know that I was talking about Ephesians 6. So you already know that. So we're not going to talk about the whole armor. Put on the whole armor of God, as the Bible says. So we don't, we're not going to talk about putting on the whole armor of God this morning. But what we're going to talk about is the process of putting on that armor. And without mentioning the armor again, let's go to chapter 4. Paul says, I beseech you therefore a prisoner that you walk worthy to the vocation wherewith you are called. What's a vocation? You need to look that up. With the lowliness and meekness and longsuffering for bearing one another in love. He's telling you how to walk worthy of the vocation. You walk with lowliness, meekness, longsuffering for bearing one another in love. Then he goes on, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above you all, through all, and in you all. So there's not a bunch of denominations, is there? So we need a revival that impacts denominations, and there's a name for it. We're not going to get into that this morning. So we're, we're going we're to go, we'll look at that maybe later on. He said, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now let's look at the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he has ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What does that mean? Now that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lowest parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. What's a vocation? Till we all come, what's a calling? Till we all come to the unity of faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now I could go on. 
And I could read chapter 4 and 5, but I probably won't even get through this this morning. So let's back up and, and, and we, we look at this. And when I ask somebody what you believe or what is your, what's your faith, they usually tell me a denomination. Denomination is not a faith. Uh, denomination is a system of government whereby we're supposed to operate by faith in what we believe. But denomination is not faith. It's not a faith because the Bible says there's one faith. The Bible says there's one God. That's clear. I mean, if you believe there's another God, you've already messed up. And, and you know why they don't like Jesus? Because he is an absolute and he leaves no room for no other God. He's not going to share his throne with anybody but me and you. For we will rule and reign with him. We are the Christians. There is one hope of your calling. What is the ho one hope of that calling? That we will all come together in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, he said this, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. It sounds like to me that you're either in it or you're not. If there's just one, you're either in it or you're not. And see, there's, there's a lot of churches that won't receive my baptism. There's a lot of churches that won't, that won't serve me communion. Well, if there's one faith, why won't they? If there's one baptism, why won't they? Because they're confused about what they believe. They've allowed the enemy to separate them and isolate them and convince them that they're something that I'm not. We're either in Christ or we're not in Christ. Period. We're either in grace and in truth or we're not. It really is that simple. And once you're in this truth, in the grace of God, this truth has the power to make you free. Now, see, I was raised holiness. I don't know if that's a denomination, but it is an attribute of God. I think men made it a denomination because it was presented unto me as a religion. Now, let me tell you a little bit about holiness. Holiness says you can't dance. Now we're over that and we all dance. Praise God. Holiness says that you can't go to a movie theater that you, got, you can't wear jewelry, that you can't wear makeup, that a woman's hair has got to be down to here. Or that's the minimum requirement. And, and you got to dress a certain way and you got to look a certain way. And, and when our generation come along, we looked at that and we said, that's not freedom. That's not holiness. We don't, I don't know what that is. If you need that to make you holy, then you do that. But that's not what I need to make me holy. You see what I'm saying? And, and I'm not saying those are not good ideas. They are good. I believe a person ought to dress decent and I believe a person ought to carry himself a certain way. And I believe there's a lot of movies you ought not see as a Christian. I'll just go ahead and say it. But, but you know, in, in that, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that God says, this is my standard of holiness. Those were personal convictions that people made a religion out of and put upon a generation that said, no, thank you. That's what they were. My mother had a friend when I was growing up, and she said, oh, my God, Josie, when you cut your hair, I thought you were going to hell. Mama needed a haircut. Okay? She was so far into religion that now she got haircut too. But she was so far into religion that she didn't understand holiness. We thought that holiness was a standard of natural living that defined who we were. But I'm going to teach you what holiness is this morning. That's where I'm actually going. Now, the Bible says that the truth shall make you free indeed. Now, when I, was, when I began to seek God about going to Africa this year, and I knew we were going, so I began to seek Him about it. He, one morning He came to me and He spoke two words to me. Or he spoke several words, but he says, I am giving you might and I'm giving you power. Okay, you, you shout. I didn't shout. I already learned better to shout. Because if God gives you might and power, that means you're going to need might and power. He doesn't give you something you don't need. I know that I'm going to be faced in a circumstance where I'm going to need it. 
God doesn't give you an anointing just because he wants to anoint you. He gives you an anointing because you're going to need it. He did not anoint David to be king because he thought it was a good idea. He knew that he would need that anointing to be the king. You see what I'm saying? Because every king has to carry an anointing. Now, so I began to look this up. And, and, and so in the last trip to Africa, God told me, he said, I'm sending you on a miraculous journey. And so I began to imagine what that meant and probably shouted that time. And, and then he said, and I began to, well, I was going to Kenya and I was planning on going, I was praying about going into Uganda, didn't even really have time to pray. And God said, I have an anointing waiting for you there. And I thought, well, I'm going to go. If God's got something waiting for you, I don't care if hell's in the way, go. You know, that, that's, that's the problem is we look at the obstacles instead of the blessing and we look at the natural instead of the spiritual and we begin to get discouraged. And the first thing that God told every man he ever called was, be not discouraged. Do not have fear. Look it up. Joshua. Moses led them through the wilderness, but Joshua was about to face all the wild cities with giants living in them. And he told Joshua, he says, do not fear. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Don't, don't be confused. Don't be torn apart about all this. He said, I'm the Lord. What more do you need to know? The Bible says in the beginning, God. When we get over that, everything else just falls into place. So you see, I mean, God spoke this to me, and, and, and you know, now I, I actually I feel like I know a lot more about what a miracle is. Because when God spoke that to me, I thought, well, we're going to see miracles of, you know, healing, and, you know, we're going to see deliverance, and we're going to see limbs grow back, and we're going to, you believe God still does that? I mean, I do. I mean, we're going to see blind eyes open. We're going to see deaf ears here. I'm telling you, not one crippled person got healed. Not one blind person. So none of that happened. I was like, wow, you know, those are gifts of healing. Yes, they are miraculous, but they're not miracles. Miracles are specific things that are unexplainable in the natural realm, but God is walking you through. And even though you and they operate sovereignly by faith, and without faith, you will turn around and walk away from your miracle. Are you listening to me? If you do not believe the word of God, you will turn around and you will walk away from your miracle and you will never receive your miracle. You may be praying for a miracle here this morning, but it might not be a miracle is what you need because you don't understand what a miracle is until you experience them. You're saying, Pastor, I need a miracle in my finances. You don't need a miracle in your finances. That is not miraculous. You're like, well, it would be to me. What you need is power in your finances. Because the power to get wealth comes from God. The Bible says that. It doesn't say the miracle to get wealth because getting wealth is not a miracle. Getting wealth is something that you do in, in a job or a vocation or, or whatever, but, it, but God gives you the power to do it. What does that actually mean? Power means vigor, the ability to do something. And, and many correlations can be found in the Bible. Samson's strength lay in his hair but his hair had nothing to do with it. His hair, not cutting his hair, was about obeying God. And obedience brought the power. The Bible, when, when I read and studied Samson, he had his hair woven in seven locks. I mean, you ain't cut your hair your whole life. It, it's, it's, it's big, you know. So he's got his hair woven. And the Bible says when Samson stood and shook himself, he, what do you think he shook? When he shook his, he's half hair at this point. Come on. He shook himself. His hair shook. And the anointing of God fell out upon that and out of that. And he began to do miracles. It's not a natural thing to take the jawbone of a donkey and slay a thousand men. Because these are not just men. It'd be one thing to walk into a, a city. 
and randomly choose a thousand men and kill them with a bone. But this is the elite guard of the Philistines. They are armed. They are armored. The reason Philistine had rulership over Jerusalem and over all the Jews is because they knew how to melt steel and their swords would break the weapons of all their enemies. And they had this knowledge. And, and, and when they did this, and Samson steps up against the most elite guard they had and slays a thousand men. And the Bible says when he was done, he was faint. In other words, he was almost dead because the anointing will push your flesh beyond what you can bear. But the anointing, if you walk in it, will deliver you through that situation. So after that, the Bible says that he drank and he was refreshed. Now, you know, I've said this before many years ago, I believe, but how would you like to be the, the, the guard or maybe the survivor of the thousand men that died? And you were reporting to the king. You mean a thousand of my elite guards was slain by one man? Yes, sir, king. That's what happened. I'm telling you, there was nobody else on the battlefield. A thousand men, of your, the, a thousand of your most highly skilled warriors, your biggest, strongest men, and your greatest weaponry was, was killed. The rest of us just had to leave. I mean, there was no hope for taking this man, alive or dead. And, and, and you know, the king said, wow, you know, that's... that's what was his weapon? What was his weapon? To the natural eye, the natural response would be, I'm going to get my head cut off for this. But it was the jawbone of a donkey. What's the message to the king right there in that? You think he didn't understand? The God of Israel is so powerful Look what he did to you. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. See, because I begin to learn these things. When God says, I'm giving you might and I'm giving you power, I begin to study what might and power is. And, and the, the Bible teaches us these things. And might is both physical strength and wisdom. That's what it means. It's not, the, it's not the power to take a bone and kill the enemy, but that is, if that's what you need, the power will be there. Amen. So then we look on and, and you can talk about a field. And, and the Bible says that if a field is not fruitful, it lacks the power to bear fruit. Now, so when God looked at man that had sinned and he told him, he said, the ground will be cursed for your sake. And it will no longer give her strength. Same word. It will no longer give her power. In other words, when you were over there in the garden, all you had to do was prune the vines. There was no weeds. There were no briars. And, and, big, and fruit just bore year-round. There was no season of harvest. The ground was continually fruitful. He said, that's not the way it's going to be anymore. He said, you're going to work and you're going to sweat and the, and the curse is the sweat that runs down your eyes and burns you. And, you're gonna, and the earth's going to yield a small harvest because I'm taking the power out of it to do so. I'm taking the strength, the ability out of it. So when God says, I'm giving you might and I'm giving you power, he said, I'm giving you something now. So immediately if he gives me wisdom, I need to know what he's talking about. So when I begin to study, of course, I start running scriptures through my mind, not by might nor by power, but God's given me something I need. Now, here's, here's the challenge in the church today. God anoints somebody. Stay with me just a few more minutes. I'm going to dismiss you. I didn't say I was closing. God anoints somebody. God gifts somebody. He gives them gifts. He gives them talents. He gives them abilities. It may be a prophetic gift. It may be the, a, a worship gift to, to, to lead. It, may, it can be an anointing. He, he, he just gives it to us because he's a gift giver. God is a giver. Amen. Period. God is a giver. That's like God's a giver. You know, when God began to give, he, he told me how much money to give. I thought, whew, Lord. I said, I just gave. I said, at first fruits offering, I just gave, God. Well, God knew that. You know what I mean? But I thought I should remind him. You know? But see, God is a giver. And so people in the church, we get these gifts, we get these anointings, we get these callings, we get these vocations, we get these offices. 
And all of a sudden, we begin to use the gift instead of allowing the gift to use us. You need to really understand that. When God gives you might and power, we begin to use that might and power. There'll be a demonstration of that might and power. I bet Samson could have got an audience with the king of the Philistines after he killed a thousand of his men. And I bet he could have strutted in, said what he wanted to say, and strutted out, and nobody would have said nothing. But that's not what he did. He messed up in his own way, like we all do. But the point is, is that when God speaks something over your life, I'm telling you, the voice of the Lord is full of power and it's full of majesty. And when God speaks it upon your life, it is. It is word. It is fact. It is truth. And he'll give you the grace to bear it. Now, when God tells you he's going to give you might and power, it's because you're going to need it. Now, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take you to freedom from here. You've got a lot of studying to do. Amen, Pastor. I said you got a lot of studying to do. And nobody said nothing. Yes would have been good. Amen would have been better because you know what amen means, right? So be it. So, you know, that means you agree with me. So you got a lot of studying to do if you're going to get caught up on this lesson I'm in the middle of here. Because this is a God thing. This is something that will, uh, this will work if you'll let it. And so as we, as we look at this, we're going to talk about freedom for just a minute. Back to my holiness upbringing. I'm going to tell you something about a holiness upbringing. It wasn't free. It wasn't nothing free about it. I mean, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't even hardly live. You know, if you breathed wrong, you sinned. You needed to do, you needed to repent. We're not talking about Hail Mary here. We're talking about slobbering and crying and repenting in an altar. Amen. You know, we ain't talking about going to see a, a, a preacher and confessing your sin and, and, and get, doing some kind of penance. I, I know I'm talking about the preacher wants to see you slobbering and praying in an altar. Repenting, you know, godly sorrow is what the Bible calls it. But now, with that said, that didn't have anything to do with it either. Let me tell you what holiness is. It's real simple. The Bible says when Jesus was on the cross that he cried with a loud voice and he gave up something. He gave up the ghost. And the book of Acts chapter 2 says that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Here's what happened. He led captivity captive. I ask you what that meant. Nobody said nothing. What it meant was is he took the things that were holding us in prison, sin, and he washed it away in his blood. It's better than that. He took the one who had the power of sin and death over us that was holding us in bondage, our captor, which is Satan, our Pharaoh, our, and he put him into captivity. He bound Satan. Are you listening to me? I believe that's when hell got gates. Mm. Then he said, that don't mean that the devil can't operate in this world because he is operating in this world. But then Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Who did he give it to? Me and you. Therefore, he bound our enemy and he set us free. But not us. The Holy Spirit is who got set free. The Holy Spirit, if you're breathing in and you're alive, the Holy Spirit, I don't care if you're a Christian, I don't care if you're a sinner, the Holy Spirit is living in you. Now this is a concept I'm going to teach you in denominational churches. Oh no, you've got to be born again to have the Holy Spirit. Are you alive? Are you alive this morning? Yes. Then the Spirit is in you. What spirit? 
I've already read there's only one spirit. There's only one life-giving spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. And whether you're a sinner or whether you're a Christian, if you're alive, the Spirit of God is in you. The difference is, in the sinner, the Spirit is bound by the souls and the passions of the flesh and the sin in your life, and it's in bondage. And Jesus came to set the captive free. So when Jesus set you and me free, he didn't just set me and you free. He released something inside of us. He reconnected us with the throne of God. He set the Holy Spirit free. And when the Holy Spirit got free, we begin to speak heaven's language. Miracles begin to happen. Vocations begin to appear. Are you listening to me? See, now I'm getting to my sermon. Holiness is freedom. Never to be in bondage again. Holiness is freedom to do and to be who Christ is. I don't have to fear hell because hell has no power. Hell is my prison. Are you listening to me? I'm not in it. It's where, I'm go- it's where we, the church, are going to put he- Satan one day. It was created for him. I have authority over hell. If your life's hell, take some authority. That's what keys mean. I have authority. Now, when you're free, when you're free, There's no gate. When I go back to Africa, I already know a lot of what I'm preaching. You got to look at it like this. In America, we have no gates. In some cities, they're recommended, I'm sure. But here in Dahlonega, we we don't need gates. Why? Well, for number one, we have the right to bear arms. Everybody in America knows when you kick somebody's door in, there's a good chance... You're going to get shot because we have a right to defend our home. So we just leave the door unlocked and say, come on in. Does that make sense? We don't need gates because we're not scared of what can walk through that door. Abraham lived in a land of giants in a tent. All the giants lived behind walls. Who was scared? Not Abraham. Nowhere in the Bible, not one instance do you find where the camp or village or dwelling of Abraham was ever attacked. We find where Abraham attacked. Maybe that's why. When Sodom and Gomorrah was taken, Abraham didn't go, oh my God. I hope they don't come here. The Bible says that he summoned his young men, 318 souls, born in his own household. Well, that's a pretty good army. That's that's just the men 20 years old. That's men of war. Then he pursues not one king, not two kings, not three kings, but five kings with 318 men and destroys them and spares all the life and brings back the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and lots the reason he done it and all of his kinfolk and everything and Abraham says, no charge. That's pretty good. Now you know why he didn't need gates. It would take a fool to attack that. Come on. And the Bible says that the terror of the Lord was upon their enemies. When your enemies living in fear, they're not coming to your house. Are you listening to me? When the devil knows who you are, and if Jesus is in you, he knows Christ. When the devil knows who you are, the devil's not going to knock on your door or try to kick it in because he lacks the authority. He is our captive. He is bound. He is bound. You just need to get him bound in whatever area you're walking in. And you just need to get the power of God. There's a release of power that comes. It don't just come. God don't give power to everybody. 
Everybody don't need it, and everybody can't be trusted with it. I don't know if I can or not. Come on. I'm not ridiculous enough to believe that I'm so holy that I'm ready to handle the might and power of God. Because I'm not. But I know that when circumstances prevail upon me, that the might and power of God will prevail upon those circumstances. That's faith. That's how my faith works. That's why when my wife reads me the statistics, I simply don't need to hear them. When you have been there and, 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 and you go into a convenience stores, they don't have security monitors. You ever seen the commercial? Banks being robbed, security guard standing there. He said, oh, I'm not a... They're, still, they're like, they're laid in the floor, do something. He's like, oh, I'm not a security guard. I'm a security monitor. He said, I'm only here to tell you that there's a robbery. Well, in the Honduras, they don't have security monitors. They have security guards. They're not there to let you know there's a robbery. They've got a pump shotgun when you walk in the door. It's only about two feet from anybody standing there. They're not there to monitor a situation. If you steal something, they'll shoot you. Because crime is so bad, that's what it takes. And you know, I'm just another blundering American. I walk in, we're having a good time. Not only is the security guard on alert, people are coming out of the back. My Lord, the convenience store is not the size of this room right here, this, this stage area. They got six or eight employees there at all times. I don't know who's in the back. I'm just in there shopping, laughing, cutting up, having a good time. But the point is this. They're so afraid somebody's going to rob them, they require that kind of security because of the city they live in. They, it's a religious town. But when you're walking with the power of freedom and the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not bound by the fears of others and by the worries of your wife. My God, that word just hit somebody. I don't know. Let me get down here. You're not bound by what others think about you. See, it, it really is that simple. I'm, I'm closing now. I want you to be free. The truth will make you free indeed. Christ will make you free indeed. When his blood was shed, all of a sudden, everyone that repented and accepted, the Bible calls it conversion, being born again, whatever you, term you want to put on it, when they accepted Christ as their Savior, the law could not... See, we, we're, we are set free from the law of sin and death. We're set free from that which had power over us. If y'all get free this morning, I'll quit preaching. Amen. You get free. When God says go into all the world and preach the gospel and teach and go and do, and, and you go, no, you're not free. You're not free. You may have a very good reason. <laughs> okay. Let me tell you something about a king. Nobody tells the king no. I don't care who you are or what you are or how you live. Nobody has the right to tell a king no. What you're saying is, Jesus, I know you said it, but you're not my king. I want you to be my savior, but I don't want you to be my Lord. That's where, we, that's where the church split the anointing of Christ right there. Stand to your feet this morning. Study these scriptures I've read in your presence. and You know, you, you, you should really study them. I, I might be misleading you. Okay? I appreciate that, brother. I would never intentionally mislead anyone, but the simple fact of the matter is, I, I don't believe that preachers, when they preach stuff that's... I've heard a lot of really good sermons that were terrible theology. Terrible. And I thought, my Lord, that man can't be that ignorant. You know what I mean? To stand there and preach something so contrary to scriptures. And, and, and then I began to realize that as God gave me wisdom, that what that actually is, it's not a lie. It's not deception. If he's not doing it on purpose, if he's doing the best he can, it's a lack of revelation. 
It's a lack of wisdom. It's a lack of knowledge to preach the scriptures incorrectly. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved, a workman worthy of the heart, rightly dividing the word. Come on. Let us pray this morning.